The most horrifying scene of the original Fly film was the moment when a human-headed fly is about to be eaten by a spider. The scene essentially downscales our human perception to show us the merciless brutality of nature. The human head screams and begs, but the hungry spider is totally oblivious. Empathy is beyond its comprehension. This horrific fate is the stuff of nightmares to us, but it's as much a part of reality as anything else in our understanding. Across the biological jungle of Earth, countless insects are suffering the blood-sucking spider fate in any given moment. On an even more incomprehensible scale, in terms of numbers, warfare is being waged by, between, and against bacteria in our surrounding environments and within our own bodies. This is every moment of our existence. If it weren't for scientific breakthroughs, such as the invention of high-powered microscopes, we wouldn't have much of a clue that this is even happening. Like the original Fly movie, Cronenberg's film presents to us the totally remorseless horror of the insect and bacteria world, but instead of downscaling our perception, Cronenberg's film upscales the horror to human size. This scene essentially presents the same merciless horror of the trapped in a web scene from the original film. Essentially much of the competition between species and nature amounts to a question of finding food, whether by carnivorous or omnivorous means, while avoiding being eaten yourself. Common houseflies aren't murderous creatures to my knowledge, but brundlefly is made to represent nature's insect predators anyway. Another scene that perhaps carries a hint of merciless insect violence is when Brundle snaps a guy's wrist in an arm wrestle. <laughs> a very interesting change to the story that could have been made would have been to have had Brundle be confused with, say, a spider instead of a fly, or perhaps be confused with a, a wasp or something like that, thus having a much stronger violent edge than a housefly. But perhaps that would be too horrific and would break us away from our empathy with Brundle. In fact, I do wonder if a deliberate comparison with spiders is being made here. There are web-like shadows cast by the skylight window frames with silent movements by the predator above. Flies don't leap upon and attack other creatures, to my knowledge. Brundle also makes his first clearly non-human vocal expression of the film, indicating that the insect has taken over for this moment. Beyond the overt scenes of violence, the fly conveys its theme of genetic small print displayed in large font in other ways that are more subliminal. The colourful opening sequence of blob-like shapes floating in and out of each other looks like something we might see through a microscope, assorted cellular organisms in different colours competing with each other for dominance. At the end of the titles, this footage becomes a shot of humans walking about in a crowded room. It kind of looks like thermal imaging because we can actually see human leg movements among the footage from time to time. But regardless of the technical approach, the sequence presents the scaling theme of the film. The dark reality of microbes being upscaled to human size, perhaps even a statement that for all our complex social and behavioural sophistication, we still are essentially the same as the microbes and fingernail sized creatures from which we evolved. We could even argue that the story is as much about encouraging our empathy with lesser sized life forms. They too are struggling for food and warmth and the opportunity to reproduce, thus fulfilling their role on the genetic line of continuity. We feel for Brundle in this story, but what about the fly itself? Brundle has intellectual conception of his genetic tragedy, but the fly is taken out of the instinct-driven, almost mindless simplicity of its existence and finds itself in the infinitely more complex reality of a human mind and body. This could be an even greater tragedy for the fly than it is for Brundle himself. At least he has a transition period. Another sneaky form of upscaling that has no place in the movie's formal narrative logic, but is great for subliminal communication of themes, is the teleport of designs. These things look like bug cocoons, and there are at least two shots in the film in which Brundle appears from behind one of these pods as if he is an insect emerging after transformation. They're round, black and have ribbed features like insects. In fact, there's a clue in the name that Brundle has given these devices. I call them telepods. So, uh, what do they do, the phone booths? Telepods. Telepods, insect pods, uh, they also remind me of beehives. 
In the marketing poster, a fly even doubles up as the telepod that Brundle steps into. Half fused with a portion of a telepod at the end of the film, Brundle ends up looking like some crawling insect like an earwig. I wonder if that was intended. So, a general theme taking a portion of reality that we gigantic human beings don't consciously relate to very much, the brutal battlefield of insects and microbes. Cronenberg upscales this stuff to human size for a particularly unnerving horror movie experience. 